Uh, welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia Online. My name is Jason Freeman, and I'm a producer and editor here in the Free Library's Author Events Office. <coughs> and I'm honored to be here to introduce Ruman Alam. Ruman Alam is the author of Rich and Pretty and That Kind of Mother, and his other writing has appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Review of Books, and, uh, the, and The Wall Street Journal, among other periodicals. He joins us tonight with the New York Times instant bestseller, Leave the World Behind, an apocalyptic thriller that follows two families who meet at an isolated vacation home during a, poss uh, during a possible cataclysm. A review in The Guardian states that Alam's novel is simply breathtaking, full of moments of exquisite recognition, and that he is a writer of scrupulous precision, drawing the reader into the world of his characters through detailed inventories of the objects about them. Uh, I've been reading uh, some of it, and so far it seems like, and, and I, I feel like a few reviews have said this, Think Cormac McCarthy's The Road meets Jordan Peele's Get Out meets Stanley Kramer's Guess Who's Coming to Dinner meets the cozy catastrophe trope. Um, this book was a finalist for the uh, 2020 National Book Award and named to nearly two dozen best of the year lists and a film adaptation starring Julia Roberts and Maharshala Ali is in production. Tonight's author will be in conversation with Carmen Maria Machado. She is the author of the memoir In the Dream House and the short story collection Her Body and Other Parties. She is the Abrams artist in residence at the University of Pennsylvania. <clears throat> and she's appeared on our stage in her own right many times and is a great friend to the Free Library of Philadelphia. Uh, so let's get right to it. Thank you both so much for being here. And the stage is all yours. Thank you. Yes, yes. Um, okay, so I have this list of questions, and I was just looking over it and realizing I started by asking about the, the apocalypse the first time. <laughs> I just wanted to say, um, you know, I read this book, and I was just looking through my email before this started about, like, when I read, I was like, oh, right, I read this book in, like, the first, like, month or two of lockdown, and I remember, oh. like, lying on the sun like this, the, the day bed in our sunroom in my pajamas, which is, like, what I was living in at the time, and reading it in, like, I think one sitting only getting up to like use the bathroom and like kind of just screaming, <laughs> like having this like very intense emotional reaction. Uh, I was rereading it today and like remembering this, like the, the, the sort of the way it felt in my body. So I guess I first wanted to ask you about, I don't know, the, the weirdness of like writing a book about like sort of, sort of a, a sort of apocalypse that then is released like into an apocalypse. Yeah, uh, yeah. Apocalypse. And just like, I mean, the weirdness of that, obviously I'm sure people have asked you about this a lot, but I'm just really curious, like, yeah, like what that process was like or like how that, how that felt. I mean, it felt really external to me, honestly, because it's, it, it, it's as much as an act, it's just an accident, right? And it sort of surprised me in the same way that I think it surprises readers who, if they catch it at that right moment, where, especially because the book doesn't necessarily seem that it's about this thing. So if you picked it up not knowing, and the copy that you looked at probably didn't really tell you what it was, right? Because you would have read an early copy. So if you didn't understand that the book was going to take an everyday scenario and twist it and pull it until you got to kind of an end of day scenario, that's one kind of fright or horror or whatever the, whatever the word you want to use for that is. But then to sort of encounter that in during this very mundane disaster that we were all living through, right? Like those of us who were not ill, who had not lost our livelihoods, who are not like worrying about um, a sister who was a nurse or a physician or something like that. Like we were just sort of at home puttering around, like making beans, making, experimenting with sourdough, like w trying to keep our kids entertained or whatever. And that's sort of what happens in the book. And it's so weird, right? Yeah. It's so weird. Um, and there's no way for me to account for that beyond that it's pure coincidence. But it's like one of those things I think that um, art kind of uh, I think art is like a magic eight ball in some ways. And we always want to shake it up and see something that is going to tell us something about the moment. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of an art that endures or aspires to endure or is rises to the level of good. Maybe it can always be shaken and offer you something, you know? And so like, no matter what the circumstances, so like a reader who's reading, you know, I don't know, Madame Bovary in France in the 1950s can find something in it in the same way that a reader meeting Madame Bovary in Tokyo today can find something in it, right? Like, it's really more to do with the reader than the thing in some way. Um, how, 
I'm curious about like the process of writing the book and how, well, I, I, I think a lot, you know, it's funny, it's like when COVID sort of started, I mean, I, because I also have like an apocalypse story in my first book and I feel like a lot of writers like Marie Ma and like the same with the John Mandela, like everyone's getting asked about like what it means to have written like a pandemic story or a pandemic novel yeah. or whatever. Um, and I, I remember when I was writing inventory, thinking a lot about foregrounding and backgrounding. So like what it means to be like having a body and, you know, in the case of my character, like having sex and just like trying to be a person while this like slow motion disaster is like unfolding in the background. And I, I guess I wanted to ask you like what part of the novel, like not even what came first, but like in terms of the foregrounding and the backgrounding of like the apocalypse mm. and the sort of human quality, like, like what was the relationship between those two, I guess, levels of of narrative or like levels of engagement as you were as you were writing or as you were conceptualizing the book? I mean, to talk about Emily's book or Ling's book, both of which are excellent. Um, so those novels depend to some degree on explaining, like the background is, is key to understanding what's happening in the, in the present action of the book, right? You have to understand that the Georgian flu has wiped out humanity and that the humanity that endures is what you're reading about in Emily's book or in Ling's book. You have to understand that she's alone in this office because everyone else has died and she's survived. And that's that pressure was not salient in this book because actually, the the pressure in this book is the is the not knowing mm -hmm. and that is such a great fucking cheat i'm like that's like <laughs> the smartest really like the like the best idea i ever had it's like oh well i don't have to say and therefore i don't have to know and i don't have to make it add up logically like emily's book i wouldn't i don't think that um Station Eleven, it doesn't labor to explain a complex backstory. It simply says like, here's this thing, there's a woman watching, you know, in, in that sort of port city and she's fallen ill. So it allows you to put those pieces together, but certainly Emily would have had to sit down and say like, here's how I'll establish the, the texture of this reality. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have to do that because I don't know what the texture of this reality is and the book never gets into it. And I have heard so many interpretations, because the book de declines to answer what the external pressure is, my, my first editor on the book said to me, described um, in, in talking about a point, a scene in the book, she said like, oh, well, so I guess when the aliens land or whatever, and she wasn't saying that there are literally aliens, but what she was saying is like, it's this kind of choose your own adventure, fill in the blank, you know, nightmare scenario that's happening, but I don't know what that is. And so I never had to do any of that labor. So most of the attention was, I mean, you're talking about background and foreground, which is an interesting way of thinking about it. But most of my attention was on the foreground I am, I am. because the background is just like, it's something really dark and it's something really distant. Did the details of the background come to you in bits and pieces? Like, was it like, as you were writing, you were like flamingos or like, yes, you know, yes. like the boom or whatever. Yes. Or the sound. Okay, so it was like coming to you in pieces. That's done. A, a little, I mean, a, a long time ago, I interviewed the writer, Samantha Hunt, um, who you may be friendly with. She, I think she's just one of like an absolute genius. And I was asking her about, uh, I was interviewing her about her story collection, The Dark Dark. And I had mentioned that she repeats a couple of motifs or ideas or jokes even. Um, you know that song, 8675309? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, like that's a, that song comes up, I think in a story in that book and then in like in one of her novels. Mm -hmm. And I asked her about it and she said to me that she's conscious of having like a system of reference and jokes that's actually only meaningful to her and only barely meaningful to her and that it doesn't really matter what it might mean. Right. And so the flamingo, for example, which there's a flamingo that appears in the book, like it, I, I, if I wasn't wearing this sweater, I would show you, I have a flamingo tattooed on my arm. There's like a personal relationship to the flamingo, but it's not interesting to even really explain. It's just like, it becomes, it's like one of the grains of sand that you're making a sandcastle out of or something. You're totally right. It's, well, the flamingo is interesting, particularly because also, like in terms of world building, because then there's this joke that repeats about like, vomit looking like a flamingo's neck yes. there's like this constant yep. sort of like imagery of the pink of the flamingo and like the neck yes. of the flamingo which i which i noticed on this reread and was like really fascinated by um yeah i, I like that you were describing it as like a choose your own adventure and i think there's something about it like i think the quality of it that is so i guess distressing um is is a sort of way in which it's like getting glimpses of the monster but never seeing the full monster. I mean, I think there's obviously like lots of different sort of logical ways to think about 
say science fiction world building and like you know like what level of sort of access you give the reader to it in your case it's like the least amount of access it's like yeah. we barely get like tiny little glimpses of like a single fingernail of the monster or like a yeah. quick flash but like that's it and like we're never going to see the whole thing whereas like other writers are like more concerned with like building like the infrastructure of the world building and trying to like make it all kind of make sense and there's like obviously like many sort of things in between um but I think for me that's actually what I found the most unsettling about it was like how little was known because in a way that's like the experience in like the beginning of COVID where it's just like what is that's yes 100 percent 100 percent like these little snippets I mean even now like I you know I mean like the Omicron stuff it gets I've been thinking about it a lot and like I know that like it's probably a whole lot of nothing and I shouldn't be panicking, but I, it's been giving me that same feeling as like when yeah. COVID started and I was like hearing about it vaguely. And I was like, I feel like kind of alarmed about this thing. And I'm trying to decide like how alarmed I should be. Um, so yeah, there's just like, it, is, it just gave me like, it's just a similar sense of like, I'm getting a snippet of something. And I, and like in this book, like these characters are constantly thinking about like, didn't she hear something on the news about this thing? Or like, yep. didn't she read something about this? And I was like, it's like, really <laughs> Like it's inside of my own head. Well, and also I think that's a really primal thing. Like I think that it it goes back to like when you were small, right? And like you Mm -hmm. heard about your classmates' parents getting divorced, and they were like, "Oh, are my parents going to get divorced?" Mm -hmm. Or like you know, you like piece together. I remember very clearly the day that I realized my mother was pregnant with my little sister, and I was like, and I was like, "Oh." what the fuck? Like, <laughs> oh, you're having a baby. Like suddenly everything makes sense to me. And I was eight years old. I was like, you know, that's not so small to not be able to piece that together. But like, still it felt like I was thunderstruck in that moment. Like, oh my God, I've, how, I've missed all this evidence and all this information. And I think we, like during COVID, for example, I mean, it's still during COVID, but like in those early days, I, I was thinking, and, and so much of the book is about this, right? Like we construct history out of all this evidence. Mm-hmm. So we say like the first world war began when Gavrilo Princip sh- assassinated the Archduke, right? But like that like comes much later. Like that mm-hmm. is like done in retrospect. So we don't know when we see these things like buried on page A14, like there's an illness, a strange illness in this part of China. We don't know that that's gonna become like the story that dictates most of human activity for the subsequent 18 months. So, and that's scary. And I think it reminds us all of being children and like with no power. And I feel that way even now. And it's like, you're saying like with, with Omicron, with Joe Biden, with like literally everything that's happening in the, in the I don't even know, in the news cycle, in the world. You, you're just reminded constantly of that lack of power and it's frightening. I think the idea that you don't know that you're seeing the beginning of something, it's like, I'm really upset. Yes, <laughs> like, it's... I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> no, that's so real. You're right, it is like being a child. It is like having no sense of like the context for anything. Um, yeah. Oh my God. Well, speaking of children, <laughs> um, I wanted to ask, you another thing that was like really emerging to me as I reread this book was just sort of the tender and beautiful way that that you write about parenthood and like like one's relationship with one's own children like there's this line about the kids like not paying attention they're like beautiful narcissists <laughs> was yeah. just like, there's I mean I don't have children but I was just it, it just seemed like it was such a perceptive and sort of in the middle of so much like selfishness and blinkeredness there was still this like t- great tenderness like for like of the you know, of um, the protagonist toward their kids. And I was just sort of curious, like what it means, what, what, how it felt to write about parenthood, like what it sort of means to you to write about parenthood because you are a parent and like, yeah, just like, I don't know, like something about, um, I don't know. Yeah, writing about kids and from their perspective and as a parent, yeah. I don't know, so. Yeah, no, I, I love being asked about this because my colleagues who are women who have children are like sometimes asked about this as though it explains everything, right? And like, it's Mm -hmm. like as though that's the sum total of their work. And men are less often, I think, asked to account for this tension between their family lives and their artistic lives. Um, I I do think that having children gave me a subject for this book. You know, Mm -hmm. I think that it's sort of like, it it was a major sort of recalibration in my own sense of self when I became a parent and like, it makes sense to me that the that the fiction that ensues is going to take that up. Mm-hmm. 
but also being on the front lines of being a parent. And I, I hope that you saw this in the book, like they're kind of disgusting. They're really animal yeah. and they're like, really like, it, it's a lot about their, their, their bodies, mm -hmm. um, which people don't, I mean, I should like, I don't know what people like and don't like, but like people don't like when you write about the bodies of children as though they don't like possess bodies. Um, mm -hmm. There's this, there's a, it, it has to, there's a, there's a, there's a feeling in the culture, I think, that it's like a line you can't cross, like that there's like, you can't actually interrogate, like it, it's like children are supposed to be precious and ideal, but they're not, they're like little animals. I mean, I mean they're literally like, the first chapter is just like how stinky the kids, like the yeah, they're, they're like the gross, heart. you know? Yeah. And, like, <laughs> and especially, especially in adolescence, yeah. you know, it's a particularly kind of weird time in human development. And I have a friend who has an adolescent son and she said this thing to me that was so remarkable. She was like, I am revulsed by the smell of his head. She was like, he comes near me and he smells like disgusting. She's an academic. And she said, clearly it's designed that way. So I won't ever have sex with my son. She was like, it's this crazy feeling that we are just animals. Yeah. And I was like, that's really interesting because I think you're probably right. And like, you're you're seeing something that's very yeah. human and very like real, but like is not really a subject for right. the novel, right? right? Or it's not really, there's an objection to talking about children in these terms. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously I like, I adore my children and I, I write about like parental feeling with a real sentiment, mm -hmm. but I don't wanna just write something that's like, oh, I love my kids and I wanna I save them. Like I wanted to sort of make, I really give you a sense of what it is like to be around little people which are, who are just sort of like large animals basically. Right. And who are beautiful narcissists. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, another thing that, I mean, I, I, and I feel like you also probably get asked about this a lot, but it, I also just want to talk about lists of objects, mm. because it's clearly yeah. a thing. I mean, like it's lists in general, because you also do a lot of listing. Like I actually was observing again on this reread that like the list towards the end of the book of like the mix, kind of this weird, all these weird, horrible things that are going to happen or that, or that have happened sort of in the context of the apocalypse sort of mirrors like the grocery list at the beginning with their capacity. Yeah for the book but like on the you know on opposite sides and and I remember the again the first time reading the grocery list I mean I stopped and I like took it to someone in my household was like I need to read you this like section of the book. <laughs> I just like read the list because not only was it exactly the list of things that I would have purchased at a grocery yeah. store in exact <laughs> circumstances and I felt very like called out and upset by that but also there was just like so much character building happening and it was just so interesting and I feel like this sort of act of like putting a lot of things together on the page and like contextualizing character or whatever, like through lists is like a really, I, I also love a list. So I don't know, like, yeah, what is your relationship with lists um, is in this book or just in general? Yeah, I mean, that, that it similarly felt like a bit of a cheat. I think I realized on this book and I, and I think actually this comes from my children. It comes from reading books to my children that like, a novel can exert like extraordinary control. And it's it's like part, it's, it's some percentage of a bargain that is being fulfilled by the reader. So the reader is constantly filling in where someone looks, how someone looks. It's their own vision of how this character looks, what their place looks like, how they're moving through that space, how time fits together. So the author exerts some control, the reader finishes the, the proposition. And I realized this in reading to my kids, like I read to my younger son in particular, sort of like more complicated novels now. And he kind of stares off into the middle distance, like he's digesting my performance of the words of some other person. So it's like handed down to him, you know, and I don't have access to what's in his head. Yeah. But you can, in some, in some ways, in some moments, the fiction can distill it down to simply uh, lists and say like, rather than labor over um, indicting yuppies like you and me who buy <laughs> organic vegetables wrapped in plastic, the book simply enumerates those things and the reader finishes that. The reader says like, oh, that's me, as, which is what you're saying and right. that's, it is me. And then is saying like, oh, it's all this plastic. It's all this stuff. Like 
she's just acquiring all the, you know, it's sort of like you can go where, it's just a different method of getting the reader to the place that I want them to be. Love that. Um, oh, I really love that. <laughs> um, but you know, it's like, you know, I mean, in your last book, and in your first book too, there's a lot of interest in and attention to, you know, folklore and mythology. And part of that sort of accomplishes kind of the same thing. It's like, like when there are animals doing weird things in this book, there's some weird human recognition of that as like a narrative device that has been, that is our cultural legacy. It's like, that's what civilization is. It's passed this to us. Yeah. In exactly the same way that like when this book plays with tropes that I only know from horror films, you don't even have to ever have seen a horror film right. to know that like, oh, somebody knocking on the door, that's bad news. Oh, they're right. a different race, that's bad news. Oh, they're gonna get they're gonna separate and go like four different ways, oh, yeah. that's mm -hmm. bad news. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it's just like when you watch a movie and there's a black guy and you're like, well, he's gonna die first or there's like a hot white girl, you're like, well, she's gonna take her top off. Like, you know, we learn these devices through storytelling. That's actually funny, because I remember, I, again, another thing that I observed in this reread was I was like, there's a lot of discussion in the beginning, which is just really like foreshadowing of like what's coming, but it's like, they're being watched like through the yeah. window. And it's only, yes. like, it's, like a, it's important from like a different horror genre. It's like, that's yes. like home invasion or like whatever, yeah. like it was like, it's, or you know, it's a totally different genre of horror, but like, in, in a way, it's, yeah, it's like engaging with this, and then it, it obviously like slips into this whole different sort of kind of genre, but you know, that's really interesting. And that goes back to like what I said about Samantha Hunt saying that thing to me, like these pressures come from the, the psyche. Mm -hmm. Like that was my biggest fear. I grew up in, a, when I grew up, my, my father was an architect and we grew up in this house that he, of his design, sort of idiosyncratic house that was in the woods. And because it was his sort of vision of a house, we didn't have any curtains. So it's in the woods, there's no window treatment. So all of the windows are bare. And I always dark. felt right, like right. somebody was watching me. And I mean, this is like the excerpts, like there's no, it, there, there, it wasn't like in like, you know, whatever. There was nobody watching me, but I always felt that. And that was a very, um, and that's like, that is a primal fear, first of all, of just being watched by, uh, by a predator. Um, but yeah, I baked that into the book because I remember that feeling. Yeah so well from being a kid. And I still feel that way. I'm such a baby, like I live in the city. And so every time I leave the city, we go like to the suburbs and I'm like, oh, it's so scary out here. <laughs> <laughs> when it's like an actual sort of patch of darkness. I actually yes. say also when I like go to residencies and stuff and I'm like in the actual wilderness, which is a place that I almost never am. Yeah. And I'm always like, yeah. it is so dark here. <laughs> like, yeah. It's weird. Stars, it's like, really weird. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. It's very alarming. Also, it's just like, that like face forward encounter with nature. Like I yeah. did a residency once. Oh, I mean, I mentioned this in my, in my memoir, but like, and there were just like animals everywhere constantly. And like at some point I went back to my cabin like at night with a flashlight and there was a, um, a rabbit that had been like torn in half. Oof, like yeah. by like a bird of prey or something and just like half of it was just left on like the stairs of my little cabin and I was just like what the fuck like yeah yeah this is I mean this is like very scary and, and, and you know and nature in that context is is mostly indifferent to us right it's like it's like the animals break the bargain by not being afraid of us or not being like not caring that we're present mm -hmm. this summer we were on Long Island uh which is sort of the territory I'm writing about in the book and um I tweeted about this but a deer gave birth we only had we, our shower was outside and a deer gave birth like right by the shower and so I went down to take a shower one day and I was like and my husband actually we, my husband was in the shower and he was like yo there's a deer here and I looked and there was a little tiny baby deer right there so right right there and I like asked somebody and they were like oh the mother has the baby and hides it and comes back with food for like a, a period of days and it moves the baby every few hours. And so the mother had come back and then moved the baby around, but this baby was just, it couldn't even stand up. And it was, especially after writing this book, truly disturbing to me to be yeah. like naked and taking a shower with like a very small deer, like watching. <laughs> Oh my God, they're right. So like the body and nature, just like, like very yeah. close proximity to each other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, something 
else that I want to talk to you about, and again, you know, I, I feel like this, this sort of the, the, the sort of wandering third person POV, which I thought, which is just such a, like an interesting, it's like a genre, it's like a, a voice I've never used. Like I've never done mm. that as a writer, but I always find it really, really interesting. Um, well, actually, sorry, before I ask this question, just a reminder to anyone who's watching and that if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A because soon we will start the Q&A portion. So if you have any questions, please put them in there. Um, but I also just want to talk about the perspective, this, this sort of thing that you are clearly obsessed with, which is like the obliviousness of whiteness and sort of yeah. really, the sort of the blinkeredness of white people. Yeah. Um, and just like what sort of draws you to that perspective kind of over and over and like what it what it is. I mean, I feel like like anything that a writer returns to over and over, it's like what are you, like what are you sort of trying to sort of sort out or like show? Um so yeah. it's like why this is just a thing that you kind of, you come back to over and over. I mean, honestly, I think it has a lot to do with my experience as a reader, maybe even more than my experience as a human being. Um, and maybe I've had more experience as a reader than I have as a human being, but I, the work that I grew up on, mm -hmm. the text that I grew up reading, as is true for almost anybody alive in the West right now, are texts of whiteness, of a kind of middle-class propriety. And like, that's what the novel is really. I mean, it's th that is changing now, but quite slowly. And so I think I'm really relitigating a lot of my own reading and the gap that I've discovered in adulthood between the kinds of things I read and my experience of the reality that feels so apart from what was depicted on the page, you know? Like I've never been a professor who had an affair with a student. I've never been like a psychically damaged World War II veteran trying to find his way in post-war America. I've never been like a housewife having quiet dissatisfaction. So why was that, why was my imaginative life, my artistic life so preoccupied with that territory, mm. you know? Um, it's hard to answer. I still love all those books, though. <laughs> right? No, I know, right? <laughs> um, yeah. I like that. I actually, as an aside, I actually am interested in the question that was asked in the Q&A, if you want to ask it, if you want to talk about it. Uh, oh, okay. I don't, I don't know if you saw it, but. I did see, I did see, yeah. I, I feel like it's like, an, it could be an interesting subject for you and I to discuss. Sure. Yeah. Well, okay. So let's talk about um, sex in writing and the role that sex plays in narrative. Well, I think that it's in an endeavor to write about human experience to overlook the physical mm -hmm. is an oversight. And I think that like physical life to varying degrees is a part of everyone's life. Mm -hmm. Sexual life is a part of many people's lives. There's a sense culturally that it is something to be discreet about, something that's sort of impolite to probe. Mm -hmm. But I don't know what the point of art is if not to kind of like dig its fingers into the things that it's told, that we're told we can't dig into in polite conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and there is a lot of fairly frank, I don't know. I mean, you're also a writer who's written pretty frank sexual work. Uh -huh, like, uh -huh. You know, there's a, there's a frankness to the sex in this book and there's a, you know, there's a discomfort with, like I had somebody, I, I, I normally do not get mad about this kind of thing. So I will begin with that caveat. But I had somebody say to me, there's a scene in which the teenage son in this book um, is lying in bed and like looking at, dirty pictures and doing like what teenage boys do. And I had somebody say to me, like, you're disgusting because you're like a dirty old man. And what I think that that comment revealed to pick up on what you and I were just talking about, mm -hmm. about race, is the inability for someone to comprehend that someone who looks like me and writing about like a teenage experience was actually writing about myself. That writers of color do, are not allowed to possess either imagination or selfhood that deviates from an established narrative. 
If yeah. I wrote a novel about like Indian women serving tea and feeling unhappy in the suburbs, then readers can accept that. Yeah. If I write a novel in which a teenage boy does what teenage boys the world over have always done, that is harder for readers to accept. Right. And similarly, like when you write about, like when you write about sex unfor in, a, in a way that is like, you're not interested in forgiveness mm -hmm. about the sexual charge <laughs> in the work, that's mm -hmm. not what, that's not what girls do, right? Like that's right. not how ladies are meant to be. Yeah. And so you're breaking some kind of expectation. Yeah. And yeah. I think that people respond. It's really interesting to me because I feel like this question, I mean, I also get asked this question a lot, like, um, why is your work so sexual? Like, why are you so interested in, in writing about sex? In a way, it's like similar to what you were talking about with like the body, where you're like, oh, but the stink of the teenage body is interesting yeah. to me. It's like physical and disgusting and interesting. And it's just like a thing that is very human. And then in, in the sort of the same way, I feel like, right, sex is so human. Um, and I think that's true whether or not, I mean, it's true also, obviously, like you were a teenage boy, you're like, I'm familiar with like, you yeah. know, like the minds of a teenage boy, like, but also just like the, the sort of, even just the more universal experience of like being horny, being horny, and yeah. like, you know, like take, like do anything about that. And actually what makes that scene with this, with the son so interesting is, is right before he gets really sick. So he's like thinking about masturbating and then he like, and then he's like, it, and then he's like sick the next morning. And like, I mean, it's sort of, I mean, like he's probably going to die. Like it does, like, he's like, it feels like he's on this like slow course toward death. And it's like this final sort of thought that's like not like the illness and like degradation of his body is like this feeling of just like, yeah. And it's actually really beautiful because he like describes the ladies, like the way he describes like the women that he wants to think about having, I don't remember exactly what the language is, but it's like really kind of tender and sweet. Yeah. And, like, and it's just like, yeah, it's like a very like human, sort of beautiful moment. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I think for me, it's like, yeah, I also like don't have a lot of patience with people who like don't care for the sex. And I mean, I don't know. I feel like also so much of it is like American prudishness, which I feel like is so distinct. Like there's just something yeah. like this lack of desire to like think about the body as like a sexual thing or to like say like what it means to feel horny or what to have sex or to like masturbate or whatever. Like, and I, I don't know, yeah. And it's like, what's, it's as human as like eating. It's like, you're gonna fucking make a list of groceries. You're gonna There's eat. a lot of eating well, in my book too. Yeah, I know. They're, they're, like, they're like a, side by side. It's they're like you have sex, side, you, you know. eat a chocolate and brie sandwich, like whatever. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> like, and, to, and especially because I, I wanted the, the novel to feel like an act of mourning for the passage right oh. through our hands of the best life has to offer. Yeah. of being together of being like naked in the sun of like being with someone you care about and like wanting to have sex with them and of eating like real like animal pleasure sensual pleasure that I think of as really deeply human like this is something that belongs to everybody and it's like I understand why it's like okay to talk about like loving like ceviche in a way that it's not okay to talk about loving like you know hopping into bed with your spouse, but I, I think that it's okay among adults to be like, well, this is like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a book about being a human being. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I feel the same way. I don't know. And I, I feel like I I once um, was at an event with Alan Gerganis and he made this comment that I've never forgotten in my whole life, which is you should give your characters a role in the, hey, they work really hard, they deserve it. <laughs> that was like really sweet and funny. I love that. Yeah. And it was yeah. so beautiful. There's just something I about like, yeah, yeah, like the idea of like humans doing what humans do, whether they're yeah. good or bad or like destined to die or whatever is going to happen to them. I mean, they, whether or not that ends up in your final draft, who knows? But like, I mean, nothing good like, is happening to anyone in this book. So at least right? like, a little, like a little right, pleasure exactly. before I exactly. dispatch them, you know, into the exactly. void. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have a question here. Can you talk about your decision to have the omniscient narrator let the reader in on the details of the horror of whatever else is going on elsewhere? It was so startling to know specifically how doomed everyone was, and it felt so different than your more standard dramatic irony that would seem to make me even more anxious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is, there's like a very straightforward answer to this question, which is that I had painted myself into a fucking corner on this book <gasps> because my editor read it and she was like, I know, I mentioned this before. She said this thing about the aliens. She's like, I know you don't want to tell us about the aliens landing, 
but you know what? It's really annoying. She's like, <laughs> she was like, these people, like the whole book was predicated on these people not knowing what's happening. But yeah. at some point, the reader has got to know something, even if the characters don't. Right, and how, and <laughs> what do you do? I was like, I, I don't know how to do this. Like, what the fuck am I gonna do? And then at some point I was like, oh, I'll just have the book address the reader. Because this book is already crazy anyway. It's already under contract, so it's not like I have to sell it. They've, or they're, they're gonna have to publish it. So I might as well just like really just like go for it. And you know, I mentioned before like reading to my children. A lot of I think I got this from reading to my kids. Like there will be these asides. They're, it's very Victorian or something. Mm -hmm. Like I feel you know to say like oh, well, this person would go on and this would happen, or this would, you know, this person doesn't actually know that this person hates them or whatever, whatever that is, that kind of leveling with the reader is a great, it's a great tool. And actually, this is how I want to write from now on because it's so yeah. much easier, you know, because if you, if you need a character not to know something that another character knows, then you could just have this voice tell it, you know, solve that problem. And, you know, yeah. And I think I'm glad that it made that reader feel anxious because it made I mean, me, you know. I mean, I feel like in all the places, I mean, there was something about, because it appears like so close in the beginning where like, it's like at some point, like she's thinking about laundry and to going to the laundromat when they get back to Brooklyn. And then you're like, oh, the launder, like the, the guy who yeah. owns the laundromat is currently like trapped somewhere where he's going to die. Like, and yeah. it's like, and, and it's like, we're sort of seeing these like two sort of separate thoughts, like moving past each other. It's like, this mundane thought about laundry and this like very real reality of, of this man being like not we were like he's not dead yet but he's going to be in a few hours like as she's having yeah no I um, have you Carmen have you ever read um the transit of Venus by Shirley Hazard no I have not okay you, first of all you shouldn't feel ashamed <laughs> about what you haven't read because okay thank you <laughs> no one has read everything and I don't want to spoil it for you but there's a detail in the transit of Venus that is buried like two-thirds of the way through an aside about what happens to a, a very tangentially related character. Mm -hmm. And then in the very last paragraph of the book, that tangential character is referred to and you understand that that person is in proximity to the protagonist of the book and that what's about to happen after you finish reading the book has already been told to you. It is so fucking extraordinary. People in this audience who have read this book are nodding their heads because it is like, it is a mind blowing choice yeah. to drop these kinds of crumbs. And it's again, about this kind of level of authorial control and Shirley Hazard was a masterful writer, but to, to I really did, I don't always, I, I'm not sure I thought about fiction this way prior, but I do feel like it is a sort of marionette yeah. experience on mm -hmm. this book and that like one of those marionettes in a weird way is the reader mm. oh I love that and I feel like it's also just like a gift of the third person or like the, the idea that's like omniscient I mean I guess you could you could have one of the first person but like that sort of gift it's hard people. though they're very you know, it's totally I mean, hard. there's yeah. there's a great Agatha Christie in which the narrator is actually the killer it's a really good one. Uh, it's called The Murder of Roger Ackroyd. I just ruined it for anyone who hasn't read it. Um, but like, <laughs> yeah, there's always, there's always invention. Like, and that's what it is. Like, that's what I love seeing my colleagues, right? Like when they do something with something that you didn't think could be done, yeah. when they like bend fairy tale to their own oh. devices, like you did, right? Like, it's like, oh, I didn't know you could do that. Like, that's it's funny, a very delicious. you know? I feel yeah. like I didn't know you could do that is the most delicious feeling to get when you're reading yes. a book. Like, I yes. feel like all the experiences of mine that came, like, in the very formative moments of, like, my early writing process was me just being, like, like, reading Kelly Link and being, like, holy shit, I had no yes. idea you could do that. Like, exactly. That's, like, that's a, a great, yes, that is a great that example. That I just never knew. Yeah. And that's such Absolutely. A good yeah. Um, okay, so we have, let's see, another question here. Um, would you talk about whether you've been writing during the pandemic? I've heard of so many fiction writer, fiction, writers of fiction who haven't, and what you've been working on and or have planned. Um, yeah, Carmen, you and I were talking about this a little bit before. Okay, like, right I mean, I think, I don't know. I mean, you you moved into a new house. You had a lot going on. Like, there, we were all feeling anxiety. Like, we were all feeling anxiety, yeah. every one of us. Especially, I think in some ways even, I don't know how to say this, but like there's a different pitch to the anxiety of people like us who weren't really in danger. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. because it, it right, yeah. it was like a di- it was like almost harder to direct because the tra- the everyday experience of life was like, oh, I, I'm here in my house and I'm doing this thing, but like there's this everything felt uncanny. Um, for me, and I don't know if you feel this way, a lot of the pr- production of fiction requires a kind of friction with real life with like going and going to stay in a hotel to do an event and like talking to like the girl at the counter or like you know whatever it is like driving on an unfamiliar street talking to someone you've never spoken to before running into someone you haven't seen in a long time and that is the kind of thing that keeps animates my whatever that impulse is to make stuff up on the page Mm -hmm. and I lost that experience and I'm sure you did too like yeah. And when I'm really stuck, I go to the movies, I go to a museum, I live in New York City, you know, there's fucking everything in the world here. And it's difficult to remove all of that. At the mm-hmm. same time, I am someone who really dislikes when artists of any, in any uh, field get too fussy and too precious oh, I need to have a chamomile tea at 3 p.m. and then I need the Eastern sunlight and I need the sun. <laughs> I, I, I just don't, I, I don't care for that approach. And so I tried really hard to just say like, okay, I'm going to have to learn how to write when my kids are in the house with me and they're like going to school at my dining table, which is really just like watching YouTube and screaming at me, like, you know, <laughs> whatever, whatever was happening. And I did, I did work, I did. And um, I'm glad that I did because nobody gives a shit if you work when you're an artist. It's not like you're a surgeon. It's not like you're a FedEx guy. If you're a FedEx guy, you gotta deliver because that lady is waiting for her package, right? Like if you're a writer, nobody gives a shit. And if you're lucky enough to be working writers as you and I are, who have like the ability to make something and like give it to somebody and, you know, send it into the world, the onus is on you to do it, you know? And so I tried really hard to just push through that gray indistinct feeling that all of us felt in the last 18 months and just be like, well, nobody gives a shit. I feel that way, everybody feels that way. Who cares, yeah. Yeah, you yeah. know? Yeah, yeah. I think the thing you were saying, I, I also, I mean, I was having, I was struggling to write for a few reasons, one of which I was very burned out from, my, from the last book that I'd written. And so writing was just really hard or like writing, fiction just felt it or you know felt impossible um and I but I also feel like there is something about like yeah like I, I generate so much stuff when I'm moving in the world that yeah. I'm just like, getting on yeah, yeah. getting on the transit like going out like doing whatever and like there was something about that day-to-day I mean I couldn't even read I also like when I read it's like anything that kind of activated my brain I was yeah. so stressed out that like I would just like I couldn't even read I mean I was yeah. really struggling I mean I remember like you know, it's so honestly the thing I got through your book because I was really struggling, but like I was just like lying around. I was like, I can't, I can't. And it was, I feel like horrible to say, right? Because like all this awful stuff was happening. People were like, you know, it was just like, it was like, it was just, but it was just something about it that was so sort of stagnant that it just felt like impossible to make anything. Well, I mean, yeah, I think it's it, the reason is fundamentally, I think, is that we had to exist with the conditions of depression. And so then we all got depressed. Right. When you are okay. depressed, you are you don't leave the house, you don't change your clothes, you don't really vary your routine, you don't feel that sort of like desire to get up. Like that's an Ill, it's an illness. These yeah. are the, the actual symptoms of an illness. And so all of us were kind of living in these conditions. And then after a while, I think we were all like, maybe we're depressed. Maybe I'm depressed. Like, I don't know. Maybe I should just stay in bed. Maybe I shouldn't read anything. Maybe I shouldn't feel this way. But fortunately, I think I just got to this point where I was like, okay, you're not depressed. Like you're okay. Like things are really bad that's okay, you know, you're alive, whatever, like, you have to go back to your thing, you have to do something, and I mean, I think it was for me, I had a different experience where, I mean, you also just published a book, like, right before all of this, but, like, I mean, it was, like, on tour, yeah, yeah, you you know, but, like, I was able to read, and I think reading, it's, like, true, as true during the pandemic as it was during my youth, it was, like, reading that saved me, it was reading that, like, made me realize, like, kelp, helped situate me in the place where I could write. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, someone asks, or sort of, I guess it's sort of just more of a comment, but it's actually very interesting. One of my favorite scenes is when Clay gets lost and then encounters the domestic worker but doesn't want to help her. It's very unsettling and there's so much going on there. Um, yeah, and then like the weird sort of shame he experiences when he then like relays that conversation back to George, like when they go out again. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, have you have you ever read the Magic Mountain? 
speaking yeah. of like pandemic that's like such a good no book it's actually it's a dear friend of mine it's like their absolute favorite novel in the entire world uh, and I it's, like yeah. <laughs> it's among it is among my favorite novels it's really long it is a really yeah. like it, I read it and like it's like, like the size of my face like that. it's, it's <laughs> but, pretty yeah. long and, yeah. but it's but it, it it has a real I mean Monib was just like there's an elegance to writing it really like pulls you under but there's this extraordinary scene that's quite well known in the book where Hans goes out skiing and he gets lost in the snow. I think the chapter is actually called snow. And he gets like increasingly hysterical about how he's gonna die in the snowstorm. He's like never gonna get back. Like he truly doesn't know what's like, what will befall him. And then he gets back and it turns out he's been lost for like 20 minutes. Like, <laughs> it's really funny. It's really, really funny, really well done. And that was what I was trying to do in that scene that like, mm -hmm. and that's precisely something that would happen to me. Like yeah. I just, when I drive, it's like the GPS has supplanted my actual like decision-making center in my brain. And um, I actually had this experience of driving out in East Hampton. Um, I had borrowed my agent's house a couple of years ago during the winter. And I got, I was like driving somewhere and then I'm like the GPS just like fell out. And I was like, oh, I don't know where I am. Like, I really actually have no idea where I am. And then I was like, well, I'll just keep going. And then I just kept going and then I was back. And I was like, oh, I guess I wasn't very far away. And I felt so like ashamed of myself. Uh -huh. um, you know, it's stuff like that's when people talk about fiction being autobiographical, I feel like that's the way in which my fiction is autobiographical. Mm -hmm. It all contains my own private shame. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we have two sort of related questions. So um, uh, someone says, I could listen to Ramon talk about anything, breakfast, lunch, walking, but I wanna know what works influenced his current book. And then another person asks, says, I'm so happy to hear you talk about Shirley has other books by women have delighted you like The Transit of Venus. So I guess questions about reading and, and influence. Yeah, um, I mean, I think the truth is that for me, the pantheon of personal greats is actually mostly women. And I mean, I think reading along the lines of sex is a very like reductive and silly thing to do. Um, but the spirit of the question has to do with the ways in which like many great artists who are men have just sort of historically demeaned the contributions of artists who are women by never talking about them as though they're serious, right? Like never really taking them seriously. Um, and I think just generationally, I'm not that kind of person. I mean, the writer I grew up wanting to be was Laurie Moore. Like Laurie Moore was like the godhead over my undergraduate writing workshop. Everybody wrote really shitty, shitty stories in the second person because of Laurie Moore, <laughs> you know? Every, every one of us, every one of us. Uh -huh. And so, yeah, like, for, I mean, it would take me like forever to list yeah. those writers. I mean, I think on the book that I'm writing now, I've just read, okay, I keep asking if you've read things. Have you ever read Helen Garner? Uh, wait, uh, um, um, she's a contemporary, she's a, she's okay. a living Australian novelist. Yeah. She's in her, I think she's in her eighties now. I, I just read this book called The Children's Bach, Bach, the composer. Mm -hmm. The Children's Bach is like, uh, you know, like a score meant to be played for ch by children. It is a tr an actually perfect novel. Like there are very few novels that are perfect actually. And I think The Transit of Venus is a perfect novel, but The Children's Bach is a perfect novel. Perfect. It's so short. It's so tight. There's not a wasted, there's not a wasted anything in this book. And, you know, when I come to a book like that, it's not by, ver by like, because of the sex of the writer, right? I think I'm just fortunate to exist in a moment where I can be a man and not have to sort of like discount out of hand the contributions of artists who are women, you know? And it makes me feel bad for men who are writers and readers who don't know that, mm -hmm. who don't know, you know, like it's ridiculous. That's a lot. I also, but I don't have a lot of patience for like a kind of what, what a, a, an attitude that's meant to be a corrective to this, which is like, oh, Hemingway sucks or Franzen sucks or, you know, you know, whoever sucks. I mean, I, I think that is also kind of short-sighted. I think like the canon of work by great men is significant, you know, I mean, you're allowed to have your own opinions, but like, Franzen may suck to you, but it's not because he's a man. <laughs> like, that's not what the problem is. 
in exactly the same way that like Alice Munro's problem is not that she's a woman. Right. She's a genius, right? Yeah, so like, <laughs> right, like that's her, her problem is that she's a genius. So, right. <laughs> I, you know, I think like, I, I don't love that yeah, kind yeah, yeah. of reductive way of oh. thinking about sex on either end of that spectrum. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, uh, did you, do you have any thoughts about work that influenced your, I, I'm assuming the current book means. Uh, the, the book I'm writing right now or the book or. I don't know, it doesn't say. So I don't know either, leave the world behind. Yeah. Um, um, well, for Leave the World Behind, I think I thought a lot about cinema in addition to the novel as a form. I thought a lot about Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, mm -hmm. mostly about the film adaptation. Um, I've seen theatrical adaptations, but that film is really good. Um, it's a great, uh, a long time ago when my husband and I were first dating, we had a date where we drank martinis with George and Martha in Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. And I got so drunk. <laughs> That I walked into the wall. I like was carrying the shaker back to the bar and I walked into the wall because they truly like the amount they drink in that movie is like it's like, not it's not real. Like, like nobody could drink that much, you know. It's standing by the end of that Jesus. <laughs> I think I think we had to stop. Like I think we were making martinis and then we were like so drunk we were just drinking vodka and then I was like, we have to stop. Like this game has to end. Yeah. But that's a great movie. It's a great text to think, you know, to sort of think about like authorial control and the uh, the way that the audience feels sort of implicated in what's happening inside of the text. Like, yeah. you know, I think that, I think much as I said, I think art is kind of like a magic eight ball mm -hmm. and the reader's always shaking it up and looking for something. I think that that's true for me when I'm writing. Like if I'm inside of a project in which like, this a certain kind of thing is appealing I'll find that certain thing in what I've been reading um and so for right now I would say absolutely Helen Gardner and also Jam Katsia um if you mm -hmm. haven't read Katsia um the ways in which a book can be very slender but like a weapon like sort of slip right into you is really interesting to me this idea of, the, of a book as a magic eight ball is so, or or it, like it's so fascinating because I feel like it you know, I, I often talk, because I'm also one of those writers who, like, I need to read to refresh my brain, yeah. and, like, if I feel stuck, or I feel, like, you know, uninspired, all I have to do is, like, read, a, you know, read something good, and, like, suddenly <clears> I'm, like, oh, yes, I'm, like, totally refreshed, but I feel like also, because reading is so much is this process of, like, right, it's, like, you can sort of, because, like, the text is fixed, right, and it's, like, fixed through time, and it's, like, at some point, yeah. like, the book exists, it's not changing, but, like, your relationship with the book is always changing, so, like, when you're, if you read a book when you're a kid, and then a teen, and then your 20s, and then your 40s, like, the relationship with the book is always going to change because you're changing, right? It's like you're entering into it, and, like, taking new things out of it, and bringing new things into it, and, like, it's this way that you can, like, have a conversation, like, across time, or across language, yeah. or like, experience, or, like, reading a book that's, like, in no way resembles anything about you or your life, or maybe the author themselves could never have imagined you existing in the way that you exist, yes. but, like, still can, like, yeah. commune with that text. I love the image of that eight ball. I think that's like really beautiful. Well, and, and to your point, like most authors couldn't conceive of like a dyke and a yeah. fag yeah. at all, Have right? Like, like conversation. Like yeah. that, like that <laughs> right. right? Like, I mean, right. Thomas, like Shirley Hazard wasn't thinking like, oh, someday some like gay guy from South Asia is going to like <laughs> read this book and its head's going to fall off his shoulders, right? Like, yeah. that's not like, it is this sort of dialogue with the with yourself and it's about fulfilling what you want. And so, and that's why I think when we when we as readers love a book, that feeling can be so possessive and so like powerful and like it's done something to your practice as a reader and to your practice as a human being. And like, and it's very, uh, there's something really incredible and bracing when you have that experience. And I did just, I did, like I just had this experience with Helen Garner where I read the book and I was like, oh my God, like I wanna, like I really, I was reading it, I was here and it was like late at night and I was like, I wanna like take my shirt off and go running. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It was like yeah. this crazy, like I was like, I feel like I'm losing my mind like, <laughs> I know, right? to like go outside and like do something, but yeah. I just have to go to bed because it's like bedtime now. <laughs> um, and that's a very, very rare magical quality in a book, but it's not, it has something to do with the book, but it also has something to do with you, like you're saying, like where you are in time and what it is your need is from a work of art in that moment. It's and so you kind of just keep hunting, right? It's like such a great right. feeling. And I think it's also why like a book can like speak to you at a certain age and then not later. Like I feel like I yes. revisited a lot of texts from my youth and I, that like were so special to me. 
Um, and like I'll reread it and be like, this isn't that great, or like, oh, it has moments. Sometimes, sometimes it is great, you know, but sometimes it's not. And you're like, but it like spoke to you in the moment that it needed to like be there for you and like did and yes. something, even though like as an adult, you can't appreciate it. You know what I mean? Like, or you can't, you don't, it doesn't have the same kind of hold over you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but and, like, and yet that like that remembered experience, the so remembered powerful. experience is so powerful. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I could read starring Sally J. Friedman as herself right now, and I would be really charmed by it. Yeah. But it wouldn't be that feeling of like lying in the bathtub at nine and like reading that book and being like, oh, my God, this is like an incredible full body experience. You know, I have, this, I have this experience of talking to my spouse about this book that I read that I remember so clearly from sixth grade. I remember being in sixth grade, going to the library and getting this book out called The Summer I Shrank My Grandmother. And the premise of it is that a girl like wishes her grandmother would not die because she sees her grandmother kind of getting old. And so she, and she like casts a spell or she does something by accident and the grandmother begins to get younger and younger and younger. And there's this like image at the very end of the story of like her holding her grandmother as like a baby, but she's like trying to stop the spell because her grandmother's like fading away and is like it's to the point gonna be nothing anymore. And she's just like regretting her wish. And like that image of like a girl holding the infant version of her grandmother. I love that. Yeah. Like, it's so beautiful. And it's the one thing I reread, I reread the book because I saw it somewhere and I was like, hey, whatever, it's like fine. It's like very, <laughs> but like, yeah, that, like and I would have described people, they're like, that sounds incredible. And I'm like, I know, I just remember this book so clearly from my youth, like it was just so important to me. I don't even think it's that great of a book, probably, but like, I don't know, it's just really special. Do you know what I mean? I mean, hopefully, I, I don't just slander anyone who. It, <laughs> well, I mean, it. it's just, it, yeah. it also like, it, it clearly like it did something to your brain because I feel like what you're describing is not that far from the territory you exist in as a writer of fiction. Right, exactly. yeah, so, exactly. right? Like, so it's like clearly it's like something. Yeah, it like turned this part of you on. And so we'll always be, we'll always belong in your sort of mental library. Yeah. by virtue of that you know i love that i'm gonna read that book now oh my god <laughs> yeah, yeah i make no promises but i do remember sixth grade carmen really fucking love that book. <laughs> um someone just clarified you said you mentioned garner and hazard there was a third writer jan some i think someone just trying to clarify which <clears throat> jm jm katia who is a nobel laureate from a few oh, years JM ago Kutia. oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. um and i just found his work really it's like uh, reading his novels is like taking a teaspoon of mercury or something. It's like, it's like they're so like it's like you should like you shouldn't you should never take a teaspoon of mercury. That's, what, that's, that's, that's <laughs> just to be clear. But that is what his novels feel like to me. It's like right. it's like biting into a thermometer and swallowing the mercury and and dying that way. Like. That's what <laughs> <feel> like. <laughs> Ramon, this has been just absolutely oh, delightful. I so wish you could have been in person, but it was so good to talk with you. I know, I know. The pandemic would have been so much more fun if we could have had Zooms like this once a week. I know, I know, right? <laughs> All right, everybody, if you have not read Leave the World Behind, you absolutely must. It is perfect and wonderful and very stressful and gorgeous and amazing. <laughs> so thank you so much for coming out. It was so good to see all of you. And yeah, have a great evening. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye.